Psalms, we have again this picture of the vine that God plucks out of Egypt and transmutes into the promised land and he plants it and he takes care of it and he waters it and he prunes it and he does all the things that are necessary in order for this thing to grow uh, and yet here it is being damaged, being held, you know, held back, being abused and, and uh, almost even neglected. And the psalmist says, uh, we're the ones who are responsible for that, but oh Lord, forgive us. Turn your, don't turn your back on it. Turn your face toward your vine and allow it to once again grow. And he promises at the end, cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved uh, o Lord of God, uh, O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Uh, the, this, this restorative idea, we've messed this up. You be forgiving, and then we will be responsive. That's the promise, isn't it? All the way through, God's people keep going back to him. Oh, Lord, we've sinned. All the way through the judges. Oh, Lord, please send the Philistines away, right? <laughs> oh, Lord, please allow our plants to grow and our crops to come to maturation and uh, Gideon down at the bottom of his wine press trying to trying to uh, sift wheat uh, and by throwing it up to the top and letting the wind blow the stuff away uh, the the picture is always God's people coming back to us yeah we messed up again would you please forgive us and please bring the crops back and uh, that's kind of the story all the way through Ben quickly and then we're gonna keep moving Yep, there's all kinds of prophetic messianic language right there in the old 80th Psalm. Uh, did, you, did you hear son of man? Yeah. So uh, Jesus is going to pick up on those Old Testament phrases and particularly son of man. Uh, and he's going to just keep bringing us back around to this, this tension between the son of God, uh, clearly not of this world, and the son of man, absolutely earthy in this world and uh, he is both okay so jumping out of the psalms over to isaiah we're going to have three references from the prophets isaiah the fifth chapter isaiah five and we're going to read verses one through seven isaiah five first seven verses <clears throat> And these are going to get gradually more pointed as we get further into uh, the prophets. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around and removed its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He uh, also built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes but it produced only worthless ones. Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not already done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up in it. I also will charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel. Let that sink in for a second. And the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, cry of distress. Now we're starting to get into this, this prophetic theme, right? What was I looking for from my vine? I was looking for good fruit. What did I get? Nothing but distress among those who are disenfranchised. Uh, nothing but cries of justice that resulted in bloodshed instead of, of justice. And uh, that's, that's kind of the, the prophetic ruler that's going to get laid down on uh, on each generation of Israel and then later on the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, 
Are you doing the things that God wants you to do? Well, yeah, we got the Sabbath going, and then we go to temple three times a year, and, you know, we're doing all... No, 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 no. What do I really want? I want justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You know, those, those prophetic messages that we tend to filter through a social gospel kind of filter because we lived through the 19th century and we saw how poorly that worked. Um, that's not what God's talking about here. He's not talking about the church doing good things just because we're good people. <laughs> He's talking about a vine that can produce nothing but good fruit. How in the world could I look at this vine that I have tenderly brought to fruition and it's now producing fruit but not the fruit that I had in mind. It's producing this, this bitter fruit that if I'd known it was going to do that, I would never have planted it in the first place. That's kind of the thought process. Okay, but it gets, it gets more specific than that. Jeremiah, the second chapter, Jeremiah 2. And we're going to read 20 and 21. Second chapter of Jeremiah, verses 20 and 21. Jeremiah is never one for uh, beating around the bush or the vine. For long ago I broke your yoke and tore off your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. For on every high hill and under every green tree you have lain down as a harlot. Yet I planted you a choice vine, a completely faithful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate shoots of a foreign vine? Whew. Could he have gotten any stronger words than that? Um, Jeremiah will have none of this business. And notice the attitude that he, that he paints uh, Israel with. Uh, you, you just, you're just violently opposed to being who, you want to, uh, who God wanted you to be. You are just completely 180 degrees out of sync with what God wants you to be. And the fruit from your vine is 180 degrees out of sync with what God wants you to produce. The kiss of death on this one is the last of the, of the prophetic uh, passages we'll read from Hosea. You could count on Hosea. <laughs> if you had to guess where we were going next, Hosea is what you would have guessed. Hosea, the 10th chapter. Hosea puts this all away in one verse. First verse of the 10th chapter. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. Pause and ponder that one for a moment. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more fruit, uh, the more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. The more blessed Israel became, the more... Uh, abhorrent <laughs> Israel became to the God who planted him there in the first place. Uh, God from the very beginning says you shall have how many other gods before me? None. Okay. And yet every time there's a good harvest, hey, what new God can we build a new altar for? And the reference to the high places. Uh, there's a hill up there doesn't have an altar on. Let's go build an altar up on top of that new hill over here. Right? So this, this is an ongoing theme. Israel is the vine. And how well does Israel do as the, in their job as the vine? Producing what God wants them to produce. Can you even point to a time when Israel produced the kind of fruit that God wanted from them? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I agree with Ben completely. The, the kingship of David uh, is a time when we don't hear an awful lot about um, uh, Israel wandering off uh, worshiping foreign gods. Does that mean that didn't happen at all? Probably doesn't mean that. <clears throat> but, but it does mean that, in general, the tenor of the socio-religio uh, structure 
of Israel at that point was eh, more or less in tune with what God wanted them to be. How do we know that? <coughs> what evidence <coughs> do we have of that? What do you see the prophets doing during David's time? Nathan has a couple of big things. What's his biggest thing? The, the one you all know, right? What does Nathan do when he goes to David? Thou art the man, right? The prophet is focused on keeping David right. And the implication is, when David's right, Israel's right. And to his credit, that seems to have been basically how this worked. There were undoubtedly people on the fringes wandering around. The point is they were on the fringes. They weren't in the middle. They weren't the, the, the top part of the bell curve. They were, they were folks who were out there on the edges, and they weren't shaping the nature and the character of what it meant to be an Israelite uh, at that time. There's a lesson in there somewhere <laughs> for, for the, the impact that the church is to have on the world. And I don't want to take it too far because I'm not that smart, but um, David is as close uh, as we get to the idea that God had in mind for his people from the outset, from the time of Moses. Um, Deuteronomy says, you're going to have a king. You're going to ask for one. Uh, and so here's the, here are the things I want out of your king uh, when you finally do ask for him. And, and David comes up. Well, Saul comes up first, big, tall guy, you know, gives those of us who are vertically challenged hope. Uh, big, tall king, how well does he do? Not all that well, okay? He doesn't even finish uniting um, the 12 tribes. And uh, he certainly isn't the one who conquers Jerusalem. That's David. But uh, at, at the end of the day, David kind of serves as this, you might be able to achieve this level of performance that God has in mind for you if you had the right king who just happened to have that combination of loving God, knowing when he stepped out of bounds and knowing how to fix that, and a devotion to applying that love of God to being the king. And uh, we really don't see anything that even resembles that afterwards. Solomon is going to introduce all kinds of idolatrous practices uh, in, in just another 40 years. Uh, and it doesn't take too long to change the nature and the tenor uh, of that. So when God calls Israel his vine, he has some very specific things in mind. Israel is to bear appropriate fruit for her owner, planter, uh, uh, master, okay? Uh, and that's really the only functionality for having a vineyard, isn't it? There's, if, if you're not getting fruit, then there's not much reason to have that vineyard. Uh, they're, they're not particularly nice looking. Nobody goes out and says, oh, what a beautiful vineyard. No, it's the fruit that we're after. Otherwise, turn it into green pasture. That's a lot, a lot more uh, poetic, you know? Uh, yes. Yes, right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And the whole idea behind uh, being a vineyard master, a, a vine pruner, is to know how to go about pruning so that you get the right fruit, so that you don't get too much underdeveloped fruit and it never matures and that you now know as much about vineyards as, as I do. I'm, I'm not well versed in that. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, somebody's got to be attending to that. We're going to get to that in just a moment because I think that's the crux of this matter. Well, it's one of the cruxes of this matter. Yes, great. <laughs> in fact, I've got an Oregon grape in, in my front yard that I'm constantly having to stay after. It would take over the whole front yard. You definitely do not eat it. And I wonder about the birds who come along. And you, you don't, you're not tasting that stuff, are you? That's, it's, yeah, I, I, and that's a, that's a great, great point for 
uh, Oregonians. I'm, I'm a Washingtonian, so, but I'm, I was a native Oregonian. Uh, who in the world, in their right mind, would see a, an Oregon grape say, oh, let's try some of those? <laughs> Your grandson, he likes them. Well, you know, to each his own. At least they're not poisonous that I know of. But yeah. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Uh, the, yes, sir. Hmm? Uh-huh. Yeah, I've heard that. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, the, the concept of how to know what to prune and what to leave is really, really centrally important. We're going to get to that in, in just a minute. Uh, just a couple other things to notice. When God planted Israel as his vine... Um, he plans on getting fruit. Israel never remembers who planted her, who lifted her out of Egypt and planted her now in this new promised land. They forget it time after time after time. Fortunately, we're much better about remembering those things than they were, but um, we just have this have this terrible time remembering that that um, God is the one who brought me to the point where I am. Tis grace that brought me uh, hence thus far, and grace shall lead me home. Uh, Israel always bears fruit only for herself. <laughs> when, the, when the crops are good, everybody says, man, what good farmers we are. And when the crops are bad, everybody says, oh, Lord, please turn back to us. <laughs> you see a, a, a missed opportunity there when the crops are good, we should be seeing. Oh, Lord, thank you for this wonderful group. We give you the praise and we give you the first fruits, right? How hard is that? Why do we have such a hard time with it? <laughs> anyway, uh, ultimately, Israel is always destroyed for sin. Uh, clearly, Israel is incapable of being the true vine, all right? It's almost as if God says they're going to have to go through this exercise before they'll believe that my plan is going to work for them. So, okay, let's plan them. Let's give them the best possible uh, opportunity. Let's give them multiple opportunities. Let's let them see how when they fail, things don't work, and when they succeed, things do work. Let's see if they're capable of doing this. And at the end of the prophetic record, the answer is, no, they're not capable of doing this. They're just, they just don't have the wherewithal to be able to do this. Bob, you had a comment? Yes. There you go. Yeah, TV certainly hasn't helped us with models for uh, good behavior. So, uh, yeah, we want to keep that in mind. All right, so flip now over to John, the 15th chapter, and let's listen to Jesus' words. And I'm going to let this run just a little bit long since we don't have any classes downstairs uh, that uh, kids need to be retrieved from. John, the 15th chapter, starting in the first verse. Now notice, I, I started this all out with the, with the uh, sentence that I wanted you to complete. I am the vine and ye are the branches. Notice what Jesus actually says. Chapter 15 of John, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. We haven't made any mention of branches yet. We've got two important functionalities here, not just one, all right? So here we have God saying, let's try Israel as the vine. And sure enough, hundreds and hundreds of years and multiple times through, we find that Israel doesn't have the capacity to be the true vine. So God says, all right, pop up Israel, plant them over here for a minute, pop down my only son, who is now going to be the vine, and I, God, am going to be the vine dresser, the one who decides 
which branch to prune and which branch to leave and how to go about uh, working the ground and to provide the resources that are necessary for that kind of growth. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Now we talk about branches starting in, in verse two. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit. Verse three, you are already clean. The word there literally is pruned. It's the same word as what was used uh, in verse two. He prunes it so it will bear more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither, you, uh, neither can you unless you abide in me. Okay, so this is, a, this is a radically different view of how the Christian life works than what we were really expecting, isn't it? Because now, instead of Israel, and, and who's the new Israel, by the way? Uh, that would be us, right? The church, okay? Uh, we've been grafted into that vine, Paul's language. And so uh, this applies every bit to us as an organization. Uh, can we rely on the church, that is us, to have the normative effects on us that need to happen in order for us to behave the way God wants us to behave and therefore to bear the fruit that God wants us to bear. Can we rely on the church or do we need some pruning from an outside source? Okay, it really seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? That's why uh, Jesus says in so many words, I'm the true vine, no time for branches yet, my father is the vine dresser. Now, how much pruning does Jesus need as the true vine? He really doesn't need any pruning at all, does he? Because he is God. You see the beauty of this, of this picture that, uh, that God himself has painted. I tried you guys as the vine. You don't have the wherewithal to do that, so I'm going to replace you with me. <laughs> now the vine will be perfect, and now you'll be able to draw sustenance out of that vine instead of trying to draw sustenance out of yourself instead of trying to bear fruit on the strength of your own good looks and your own good genetics now you'll be able to draw your sustenance and bear your fruit from me from god himself has found a way to interject himself into our lives in such a way that we just we just naturally bear fruit that comes from this. This is, a, this is an amazing, amazing concept. Come right on in, folks. Don't worry about this. I'm just up here blathering at the front. So just come right on in. Um, and, and as a consequence, think about the things that have changed when Jesus becomes the true vine and replaces Israel in that role. What could Jesus do as the true vine that Israel could never do on her own? Okay, number one, Jesus can redeem the branches uh, in ways that Israel never could. How about bearing fruit? Could Israel bear the fruit that God had in mind for her to bear by herself? Clearly not. She had multiple opportunities, never did it. Okay, so Jesus replaces Israel. Israel becomes branches instead of vine and branches, and now all of a sudden, everything starts working the way it's supposed to. And sure enough, God's plan turns out to be smarter than humans' plan. Uh, a couple quick things and then we're gonna close up. How did Israel's history make evident the need for the true vine? Was it going to get any better if God gave Israel another chance to be the vine? Clearly not, that seems impossible, right? You can only do these things so many times before you start saying, eh, this looks like the same results we were gonna have last time and the time before, oh, and the time before that, right? Okay, and finally, I think this one is the, is the last nail in the coffin. How does this shape our understanding of the need for the true vine? How well are we going to do producing our own fruit if we are producing our own fruit? Uh, 
that doesn't hold out a lot of hope for, for uh, great results because in, in every way possible, we look a lot, a lot like is Israelites. <laughs> Left to our own devices, we tend to bear our own fruit. And, and when shaped and pruned and challenged and, and uh, caused to, to wonder about things, we have a tendency to, to turn and shake our fist to God. Why aren't you being nicer to us, right? It is the requirement of this experience that God replace Israel as the vine with the true vine, his son, the son of God, the son of man, is the only one who can provide this. Now, this allows all kinds of stuff that we will talk about next week. The, the, the thing that I want us to talk about next week is what constitutes fruit. Because I've got to tell you, growing up in the churches I grew up in, what constituted fruit was new Christians. Have you converted anyone recently? And you know what? Not many of us do that. There are some of us who seem to be specially equipped. Who knows? Maybe even a spiritual gift uh, for being able to do that. And many of the rest of us simply don't seem to make those connections. Or if we make those connections, we can't get them over the finish line. And I think that's okay because you know what? When Jesus talks about fruit, he doesn't talk about you going out and converting other people. He starts right here in chapter 15. He's going to repeat it over and over and again since then. Love one another as I have loved you. Can we do that? Does it require any special spiritual gifts? Now Paul's going to add a whole bunch of more of uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, yada, yada. Okay? That's a, I got four of them. That's actually not bad for me. Um, I think that's in um, Galatians uh, 5. Um, you know what? None of those things keep us from bringing other people in. But if you're singing, Are, will there be any stars in my crown, especially if you're following it up with no, not one, um, you, you, you really need to focus on, is that what the metric is that God's using for you? Or is he using something that he talks about a lot more than that? If we loved each other the way Jesus loved us, what do you suppose would be the impact on people who were around uh, looking at us? It'd be real hard to keep them out the door, wouldn't it? No, no, you can't come in. We're already too packed here. It would be a lovely problem to have, wouldn't it? Okay, so what we want to do here as we go to next week is to remember that God tried it our way. It didn't work all that well. He replaced Israel with his son. The son is the new true vine. God, who has always wanted to be the vine dresser, is the ultimate vine dresser. And as we are pruned, we are pruned by God with nutrition, with, with genetic code, with all the things that shape and mold us and make us who we are, coming from Jesus himself. What a beautiful picture. Let's close with that. Thank you for your attention.